Hello and welcome. Today we are going to take a quick look at the contributions of two giants, two men whose life work was so influential and so important that it could be said to have shaped the very landscape of Hindustani Khayal music as we know it today. Pandit Vishnu Narayan Bhathkhande and Pandit Vishnu Digambar Paluskar. The contributions of these two men are so immense that all the wonderful music we've been talking about in this cause, even this cause itself, probably wouldn't have existed in the manner and the extent to which it does today without these two men. Now, Bhatkhande ji and Paluskar ji were contemporaries. They were both born and they carried out their major work in pre-independence undivided India. And both men worked all their lives to rectify what they saw as major problems in the theory, practice, pedagogy and social environment of Hindustani music in those times. But the two Vishnus, as they came to be known, were not really collaborators. In fact, they were almost rivals because they each had a very different vision for this music. But they were respectful rivals and the rich, densely populated musical atmosphere that we enjoy today has come about because their work ended up being complementary to one another's. So let's begin with Pandit Vishnu Narayan Bhatkhande. Now Bhatkhande was a lawyer by profession and a Sanskrit scholar and a musician by passion. And he had studied Dhrupad and Khayal with master musicians. But Bhatkhande at heart was a nationalist theoretician. The Indian subcontinent at the time was in the throes of the anti-colonial nationalist movement. And Bhatkhande wanted to show the colonists as well as his own people that Hindustani music had a solid, coherent, unified and ancient theory upon which its practice was based. But there was a problem here. This theory did not exist. Now, Bhatkhande went to great lengths to find and study every ancient text and relatively recent text of music that he could find. You have to remember that this in itself was a monumental effort. This was in the late 18th, early 19th century. So doing this kind of research meant, apart from studying Urdu, Farsi and Sanskrit as well as music of course, this meant travelling across the lengths and breadth of the country using whatever transport was available at the time in search of these rare manuscripts, begging their custodians to let him see them. There weren't too many easily accessible public libraries at the time. And the ones that did exist did not always have the kind of material Bhatkhande wanted. So Bhatkhande's work involved locating these rare texts, copying them down by hand, studying and understanding them, meeting various musicians and scholars to discuss and debate the grammar of the rags that were currently in practice with them and comparing this with what he found in the texts. It's a lot of work. Bhatkhande did all of this and he did it at his own personal expense and at very hard labour. And after doing this, after studying virtually all the important and less important ancient texts and music and meeting so many musicians, he came to the conclusion that the wonderful music that he had learned, that was being practiced all around him, was completely different from the music that was described in the ancient texts. The rags were different, the tals were different. Often, sometimes the rag names were the same, but the notes of the rags and the grammar that was described there was completely different from what was, what was there in practice. And so, Bhatkhande, for the first time, established the vastly important fact that the ancient Sanskrit texts, including the most famous ones such as the Natya Shastra and the Sangeet Ratnakar, were not relevant to Hindustani music as it was being practiced in contemporaneous times around him. Of course, one has to remember that there certainly are links between these texts and current practice, scholars have continued to show. But these are historical links, they're evolutionary links. What Bhatkhande was saying in his books and in his talks was that the actual music that was in practice was nothing like the music that was described in these treatises. Now, this might seem like an easy enough conclusion to come to you, read some books and you come to this conclusion. But it took years and years for Bhatkhande to do it for two reasons. One, of course, the logistical difficulties of actually accessing and studying these texts that I've described earlier and of convincing master musicians to reveal their inherited knowledge to him. And the other, number two, 
the fact that most scholars and practitioners of the time simply assumed that they were singing in ancient music without bothering to verify this. But to Bhatkhande, all this had resulted in a situation where there was no consensus between scholars and practitioners on the theory of music. So that often the same rag was sung very differently by different musicians from different gharanas. Add to this the fact that it was so difficult to get access to bandishes and to rag knowledge because both of these were guarded jealously you know, by the pandits and ustads of the time because it was their inherited knowledge. And you had a situation because of all of this that appeared to Bhatkhande at least to be too chaotic to be acceptable. Now, Bhatkhande was a nationalist theoretician at heart and his vision, he envisioned a grand, unified, national classical music, a music that was uniform across the length and breadth of the newly emerging Indian nation and that was freely accessible to everybody in a central national academy of music. So it was to this end that Bhatkhande began his monumental task of single-handedly developing a new theory for Hindustani music. So over a period of 25 years, Bhatkhande toured the entire geography of this music to collect rag grammars and bandishes from whoever was willing to part with them in whatever way. You know, sometimes musicians gave bandishes generously, wholeheartedly. Sometimes he had to pay them something per bandish. You know, sometimes he had to trick them into revealing their hereditary knowledge. And some musicians refused to cooperate. They refused to give him anything at all. Now, apart from bandishes, Bhatkhande also wanted to standardize the grammar, the rules of the rags. But there was a major question here. Now, although Bhatkhande had himself worked very hard to compare and analyze the various versions of the same rag that was being sung around him, and he had tried to come up with a standard common set of rules for each rag, how was he going to get the master musicians, the traditional hereditary pandits and ustads who were proud of their inherited knowledge, how was he going to get them to accept the rules created by him, by this non-performer, this theoretician, this lawyer? But Bhatkhande had some tricks up his sleeve. Let's listen to a short excerpt of the scholar musician Pandit B.R. Devdhar describing one of Bhatkhande's visits to the Rampur court to discuss the rules of the rag Adana Kanada, Adana, with the court musicians there and how he got them to accept the rules that he had decided upon. And they have research how they have done what they have done. When I was one day, I was that means worth listening. Pandit Bhatkhande ji. Pandit Bhatkhande ji. Many people have come to the house, but they didn't give them anything. Okay. So, Rampur went. And at that time, Rampur was the name of the Nawab Sahib. This was the name of the Nawab Sahib. This was the name of the Nawab Sahib. It was the name of the Nawab Sahib. And the name of the Nawab Sahib, it was the Nawab Sahib. It was the Nawab Sahib. Okay. तो ऐसे दो बेंचेस थी और वजीर का वो इनके इतने बड़े इनकी शान रखी रखी जाती थी रामपुर में कि दरवाजे में पुलिस बैठते थे तो बात करने साहब वहाँ गए तो इन्होंने बता दिया कि साहब मैं आया हूँ आप तो संगीत गाने वाले हैं खूब झपट जमार गाते हैं सब गवाइयों की गवाई है तो मुझे कुछ चीजें च तो इन्होंने बोला बजीर खास साहब का गंदा आपको मान देंगे साहब आप तो गवियों के गवी हैं आप ही क्यों नहीं गंदा मानते मुझे तो नारायणपुर आप बड़े खुश हो गए इन्होंने इतना गंदा मानता बात करने साहब को इतना बड़ा पंडित गंदा मानता है आप बात करने वाले ब्रिशूर वकील तो थे और रामपुर में उस वक्त सो लोग सब लोग थे बड़े बड़े सरोदी हैं सताई हैं सब साथ में जाने वाले हैं तो इन्होंने बताया सरकार आ रही है सब लोगों को बुलाई है इनके सामने हम राहों के नियम पक्के करें आज वो एक आड़ा में लेके बैठे अब किसी ने एक बदलाया तो दूसरा बोलता है ये नहीं हमारे बाप ने दूसरी तरह से सिखाया और ये आप सुनिए शायद आपका यही मत होगा मगर मैं आपको सुना देता हूँ तब इन्होंने बता देना कि वो गंदा ऐसा आएगा मध्यम ऐसा आएगा निचाला ऐसा आएगा वो ऐसा आएगा 
तो सरकार आपका आप, बिल्कुल पहचाना आपने ये बराबर है तो सब गवैया लोगों को बोल रहे सब सबको सब सबको पसंद है ना तब आप सब क्या बोले इस तरह से इन्होंने सब राग के नियम कई कई पक्के किए उस वक्त और इनको जो कैसे रिसर्च करना ये इन्होंने मुझे बतलाया था But perhaps the most ingenious and controversial trick Bhatkandi used to get his rag rules accepted was in his books, in his publications. Bhatkandi was canny enough, smart enough to know that people tended to accept anything that was written in Sanskrit as ancient and authentic. And so he wrote his own Sanskrit treatise, Shri Mal Lakshya Sangeetam, in Sanskrit. And in it, he didn't use his own name; he used a pseudonym, a pen name. The author of Shrimal Lakshya Sangeetam was the mysterious Chatur Pandit, and it was years before anybody figured out that this author was in fact Bhatkhande himself. In this book, Bhatkhande laid out in Sanskrit standardized rules of modern rags as they were sung in modern times, and then in traditional style, he wrote a commentary on this book, explaining in common Marathi for common people these rag rules. This commentary, the Hindustani Sangeet Padhati, was a massive work in four voluminous parts, which ran to almost two thousand and five hundred pages. <clears throat> in the Padhati, an imaginary guru explains the Shri Mal Lakshya Sangeet, the shlokas in it, to an imaginary student, thereby creating a consistent theory for Hindustani music that was accessible to everybody. In addition, Bhatkhande also reprinted a number of other older theoretical works on music and made them available because they were not easily available at the time. He brought them back into circulation. But Bhatkhande didn't stop with just creating theory. No, he worked hard to propagate his theoretical work too in schools and colleges and in the many institutions he founded, including the Maris College in Lucknow, which is called the Bhatkhande Sangeet Sansthan today. He groomed and appointed teachers to teach in these colleges he obtained the support of the maharajas of various princely states like lucknow and badoda and gwalior and then he set about creating textbooks that could be used to teach his theory in these institutions now so bhatkhande publi- also published a six volume set of books that contained some 1900 almost 2000 bandishes bandishes that he had painstakingly collected over many years from many great musicians through these works the repertoire of rag sangeet broke free from the shackles of the guru shishya tradition in which bhatkhande saw it is tied up all of these works that bhatkhande published have remained in print for a whole century now and they remain dependable resources for students and practicing musicians even today for bandishes for rag rules for grammar right from young first time students to legendary musicians like pandit kumar gandharv Bhatkhande's work has remained a major source for the Hindustani music community for 100 years and counting no mean feat of course Bhatkhande's work and his methods were controversial at the time and they remain controversial today but as musicologist G H Ranade has said even the musical knowledge based upon which scholars sometimes criticize Bhatkhande this musical knowledge was itself made accessible to them by Bhatkhande's efforts The other looming giant in the history of modern Hindustani music is of course the other Vishnu Pandit Vishnu Digambar Paluskar. Paluskar had received training in the lineage of the old Gwalior gharana and was a very talented musician a wonderful singer who as a young man had already begun to achieve a lot of fame and even princely patronage for his abilities. But as he went about performing he was troubled by a different aspect of music situation in pre-independence India very different from the theoretical concerns that Bhatkhande had had what bothered Paluskar was the fact that music was not seen as a respectable profession at the time music was not something that people from good families did it was associated either with illiteracy or with the wife culture and the rich and beautiful the wife tradition of musicianship had already become associated with prostitution and debauchery because of victorian understandings of morality that were prevalent at the time paluskar proceeded at the age of 25 to give up a promising career as a performer 
and set himself to the task of bringing about a social transformation in the field of Hindustani music in order to acquire respectability both for the music and for the musicians who practiced it and to remove the taboos associated with it and to make it accessible to the emerging bourgeois middle classes. Now to do this, Paluskar began his lifelong work of establishing a network of music schools. He began with his first school, the original Gandharva Mahavidyalaya, which he founded in Lahore in 1901. And this was probably the very first school that was run on public support and donations from private contributors and of course Paduskar's own personal savings, but not on princely patronage. Now, through monumental struggle, Paluskar acquired land, he built the school, he identified and trained teachers, he even founded a printing press in which to print his own textbooks and magazines on music. He then established a branch of the school in Mumbai in 1908 and moved his operations, including his printing press and everything, there, his instrument factory. In these schools, Students, often from poor families, were housed, they were clothed and fed and taught music in a regular, disciplined and systematic fashion. Parents had to sign a bond which committed students to the school, thus relieving them of the financial and educational responsibilities of their children. Obviously, two schools were not going to be enough to bring about a large-scale social revolution. And so, Paluskar started training teachers. He started a special batch of students called his Upadeshak Varga or Instructors Teachers class in which he explicitly trained his students in order to be good teachers, not performers. And as soon as they were ready, he sent them off to various parts of the country to found their own schools and to train more teachers who would go on to do the same. Some examples of Paluskar students who did this are Pandit Vinayak Rao Patwardhan, who started a branch of the Gandharva Mahavidyalaya in Pune, or Pandit Vinay Chandra Maudgalya, who did the same in Delhi, or Pandit Vishnu Annaji Kashalkar, who started the Prayag Sangeet Samiti in Allahabad, or of course Professor B.R. Devdhar, who started his Devdhar School of Indian Music in Mumbai. And all of these institutes, together with many, many more, are still around today. They still function today. So this gradually led to the creation of a vast, vast network of music schools that exists even today in the form of the Akhil Bharatiya Gandharva Mahavidyalaya Mandal, a central body that governs the functioning and the syllabus and the examinations of these schools. Many of you attending this course may even have taken a few classes at your local Gandharva Mahavidyalaya affiliated music class or given one of their examinations. The foundations for all this were laid back a century ago by Vishnu Degampar Paluskar. It is worth remembering that Paluskar did most of this work at his own expense. He invested in his mission to such an extent that it even took him into debt. And he eventually had to auction off the building of his Mumbai school. But the troops of students that he had groomed carried his vision forward and its results are there for all to see today. Now, the atmosphere in Paluskar's schools was largely disciplined and devotional. In fact, Paluskar used the tool of bhakti nationalism, of which he himself was a sincere adherent. He used it to give Hindustani music an aura of sacred purity. It was through this that he achieved his great success. The association of Hindustani music with a nationalist, religious, sacred past made it possible for more and more people to imagine themselves as musicians. It lifted the taboos that had afflicted the profession and made it acceptable to society at large. <clears throat> now, one serious allegation that was made on Paluskar schools was that his methods of training did not really produce any top-ranking performing musicians. But Paluskar's own reply to this allegation was fitting. I may not have created many tansins, he said, but I have given birth to thousands of kansins listeners, rasikas, who are knowledgeable enough to appreciate the intricacies of the music that the performers create. Now, it is impossible to fully cover the span of Bhatkhande and Paluskar's contributions in one short lecture. They did so much more than what I've outlined, sketched here. 
they both organized for example massive all india conferences of music where the greatest masters from across the subcontinent got together and performed and debated the finer points of the music they both invented their own systems of notation with which to capture bandishes and ra grammar and they did so much more but the over the overbearing overarching fact about these two great men of indian music remains the vast rich varied and globally loved culture of music making in the hindustani tradition that we cherish today and this culture owes itself to the monumental efforts that they put in and it was in the creation of this culture that their work complemented each other bhatkhande's theorization his collection and publication and democratization of bandishes and grammar and paduskar's network of schools with which to teach and disseminate this grammar and to create massive audiences that were capable of understanding and appreciating the music that the masters were creating and for this we owe them